get from tree size to tree carbon or above ground carbon? We measure trees in forest ecosystems using simple tools like Biltmore sticks or diameter tapes or even uh, cruzols for variable radius plots. But how do we get from those estimates of above ground tree size to um, the mass of carbon in trees? Well, we can benefit from previous work that has worked exha exhaustively uh, in the United States and in fact, all around the world to develop equations uh, where you can relate the size of a tree uh, in its diameter at approximately 1.37 meters above the ground to the total amount of mass in that tree. And from that, we can estimate the amount of carbon based on a um, pretty predictable stoichiometry with regard to the amount of carbon represented by dry biomass uh, of a living tree, which is commonly estimated at about 50%. So we'll get back to that later. That's a rough estimate, and I would actually, uh, I, I would argue we could, we could estimate that quite a bit lower or a little bit lower. We'll talk about that in a second. At its heart, this approach, is, uh, which is called the biomass estimation approach, is really simple. No one is going to be surprised that a larger tree weighs more. And that's essentially all this method is doing. It's saying if we measure a tree as being larger, um, we're estimating that tree uh, to be uh, larger in, in mass. So larger in diameter, weighs more, fine. But how does it do that? And so the shape of the curve relating um, the tree size to uh, tree mass varies among species and can be different. Additionally, you can use additional measures like tree height to really hone in your estimate of biomass of an individual tree species. Here's an example equation for um, Douglas fir. And in this uh, example, uh, the above ground biomass, I believe here given in, in kilograms, uh, is given by the equation 37.3 plus 139.3 times the dBH squared times height. Okay, relatively complex um, equation. There are other equations that are much simpler than this. Um, and in fact, a national set of equations that we'll talk about soon. Um, in just a second uh, has been developed that is now used for a variety of tree species based only on diameter. Regardless, a biomass estimation equation integrates uh, tree measurements from the ground, either height or dBH or height and dBH uh, to estimate the biomass of the standing tree. So simple measurements applied to estimate the biomass. Similar things can be done for logs and uh, snags. However, in this case, we need to measure the volume of that material and then multiply by a density. And there are nice lookup tables that will show us how to approach density estimates for uh, logs and snags based on sampling the wood in down material uh, for different species. So for a Douglas fir, if we can sample logs that are different ages or in different decay classes and different uh, sizes, we can look at the uh, density of that wood material. Once we know the volume, we can multiply by the density and we're left with mass. If we can ag again make an assumption about the percent carbon or the stoichiometry associated, uh, the carbon stoichiometry associated with that material, then we can estimate the percent carbon. Of course, we can also measure uh, percent carbon directly in the wood by sampling it, and that's been done too. So repeat measures of this type allow us to get net carbon gain. So at time one, the plant is small, uh, the log is large, and uh, we estimate a large amount of, a certain amount of carbon in the plant and a certain amount of carbon in that log. We come back at time two, maybe 10 years later, the plant has grown, the tree has grown, and we have more carbon. Maybe we have less material in the log because it's decomposed. When we integrate this over a series of permanent plots, we can look at net changes in carbon. This is represented in this graph by some data from uh, the Evergreen Forest Reserves uh, here in Western Washington, where we've used the Kiefer plots repeatedly uh, since 1977 to inventory large standing trees. And then we have a larger Eon network, of course, that was developed in 2006. So, from each of these uh, networks, we can get an estimate of the amount of carbon in our forest. Um, these happen to be a little bit different 
uh, plot locations, but given that they're all in the same forest, we might use this to uh, show a trend line in the amount of carbon in our forest over time. If these bars represented points along that trend line, then what you'd see is an increase from just about 160 or 170 uh, megagrams, that's tons of carbon per hectare in 1977, all the way up to somewhere north of 260 or 270 megagrams of carbon or tons of carbon per hectare in 2008 and uh, likely much more in 2020. We don't have the 2020 data here. So that trend line shows the slope. The slope of the trend line that links these bars would be our rate, our net rate of carbon increase in these plots through time. We found some really interesting trends in our forest at Evergreen. And one of those trends is that overstory richness tends to predict uh, above ground carbon gain, both in trees alone, which is shown in the black dots, and what we call net primary productivity uh, for the above ground portions of trees, which can be uh, calculated when you incorporate um, the litter material that's produced by trees in addition to the growth of the tree itself. So trees not only grow, they're also producing litter that then falls off within a year to the ground or uh, new litter, which replaces old litter that falls to the ground. So you need to both catch that litter that's contributed to the forest soil uh, and capture the increase in the size of the tree itself in order to have a good estimate of the net primary productivity. Regardless, an early analysis of our data showed that overstory richness um, predicted um, to some extent um, over 30% of the variation in net primary productivity in our forests. It's an interesting find and it's an additional find to just being able to say, um, be able to say something about the total amount of carbon in our forests or the net increase, the rate of increase in carbon in our forests above ground. So when you conduct studies like this in a permanent plot network, you get these little surprises and additional analyses that you can conduct. In order to do this work, we also have to think about below ground assumptions. And typically, uh, a biomass estimation equation will estimate that approximately 25% um, of above ground mass um, is how you estimate below ground mass. So in other words, below ground mass is about 20% of the organism. And um, uh, so uh, that means that if you take the above ground mass and you multiply it by uh, 0.25, you're approximating uh, the below ground, the below ground mass. Uh, you have four fifths above ground and uh, one fifth below. This is a very rough and coarse assumption. However, there have been multiple studies that have analyzed the amount of uh, tree root mass below ground in forest ecosystems throughout the world. And estimating this as about 25% of above ground mass is not an unrealistic assumption. It holds true in many, many temperate ecosystems. And uh, there are multiple reasons why you might suspect a relatively constant amount of, of below ground mass uh, given a certain amount of material above ground. There needs to be a certain balance there uh, that can be based um, on a mechanical requirement for anchoring uh, a large amount of structure above ground uh, in addition to uh, a set amount of uh, volume of soil explored um, just in order for a tree to uh, be able to take up water and, and nutrients in a forested ecosystem. Um, so regardless, we're, we would expect this to be refined over the years, but this is kind of the best that we're able to do uh, now, given how difficult it can be to extract all of the roots of an organism uh, below ground and estimate their mass. And so I would look, if I was a, a brand new scientist uh, entering the field of forest carbon, I would look for assumptions around this number to be refined over time in different forest ecosystems.